Hi, my name is Yasmin Tarehi, and this is Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one conversations with leading experts in wellness and spirituality. Today's episode is about how to live in awareness and be on the path of the spiritual warrior with Corlight. On this show, we'll be featuring our guest, Brad Laughlin. Brad's the author of Living with Enlightenment, A Journey of Love, and I was first introduced to Brad and Corlight from a previous guest who you may have listened to, Helena Wahbe from IONS, and she mentioned how impactful Corlight was to her spiritual journey in her book and in our conversation. Brad is the executive director of the international nonprofit organization Corlight.org, which he runs with his life partner, Leslie Temple Thurston. As a spiritual teacher for over two decades, Brad's life's dedication is to the transformation of consciousness. He's based these on the principles of non-duality, which we'll go into into the conversation, and all of his messages focus on the dissolution of our limiting ego structures and include transmissions of love, joy, and healing energy. Brad, thank you so much for joining us. And I know that you're in South Africa now, correct? Yes, that's right. Thank you, Yasmin. It's lovely to be here. Thank you. I have been such a big fan of the work of Corlight, and I was just telling uh, Brad right before we got started that I've been reading um, the book uh, Marriage of Spirit, and I also read the book The Eight Keys. So there's just a lot of information that we'd love to uh, share with you guys today. But first, Brad, can you kick it off and tell us about how to live as an enlightened being in today's world? (laughs) <laughs> well, wow, that's a great question. I love, I love your question, Yasmin. Thank you. Um, yeah, we can give it a try. <laughs> it's a big question. Um, I, I think, you know, I think first it's probably important to talk about what we're calling enlightenment because there are many definitions and many people talk about it in different ways. So, um, my, my life partner, Leslie, as you mentioned, uh, she went through an enlightenment experience in the 1980s after she'd been practicing meditation and self-inquiry for many, many years. And she described enlightenment as the complete dissolution of the ego and, um, and an awakening to a, a very deep inner awareness uh, that we are made of love. And so uh, her way of describing Enlightenment has always been to talk about it as as the continuum that we're on. In other words, there's not an end goal. It's not a fixed point where you're done. You know, that's it. Um, it's it's a continuum, and it's a path. Uh, and, and along the path, we're always discovering who we truly are. That is the path of enlightenment. So you could say that uh, enlightenment is a journey of of awakening to the truth of who we really are, which is love. And, um, and I know, you know, when we talk about this, it's sometimes it's a new concept for people and I, am not sure who your audience is, but just in case it might be new, I, I know sometimes it sounds a little bit confusing or, or maybe esoteric. So, um, I could explain a little more, um, if you like. Yes. Yeah. I think for, for those who might not be on the path already or who are just maybe curious, uh, yeah, I'd love for you to explain a little bit further. Okay. So, so when somebody asks us, who are you? We usually, uh, we usually respond with things like, well, um, I'm Mary and you know, I'm an artist and I'm, I'm an American woman. And, uh, I like, I like to dress in blue and I never wear red and you know, things like that. But all of those things are, are the description of our bodies and, um, you know, where we live and, and our activities and uh, what we like and dislike and things like that. And so it doesn't really describe who we truly are beyond the body and beyond the personality. So really, you could say so much of this path is all about our identification. Who, who do we identify as? And who are we really? Uh, you know, are we the personality? Are we the body? And are we our likes and our dislikes? And the answer is no, no, we're not these things. And we're, we're just so much more than that. Um, but it's not what we're taught in our world. We're not taught about this. So 
the truth of it is that we are each a spark of the infinite. We are pure consciousness. We're, we're pure awareness. We're pure light. We are the love. And uh, so many different religions and traditions over the millennia have talked about this in many different ways. And, and so the path of enlightenment is the path of discovering that truth of who we really are. As I said, it's pure love. And so we're literally made of a substance that uh, it can really only be described as love. It's impossible to find other words for it. And all the mystics and enlightened teachers through the ages have talked about it in that way. It's very, it's not something that can really be described. It has to be experienced. So, um, so it's a big jump, you know, it's a big jump from identifying with the ego and uh, or the, or what's also known as the personality and, and then jumping to, uh, to a full blown enlightened awareness of this, this bigger truth. And, and so, like I said, it's a continuum, it's a path and we're, we're all at very different stages of discovering this truth of who we are. And so, <clears throat> you know, back to your question, you, you asked, how do we live as an enlightened being on the planet? And I would say that it's a practice. It's a practice along the continuum, and we're all at different stages. But the the two ways that we can best practice, I think, in my opinion, which support us on that journey are meditation, number one, and number two is what we call self-inquiry. And I I know most people know what meditation is, um, but many people don't really know about self-inquiry. And, and I know you said you've, you've read our book, so you know that that's really what we write about. It's this path of called self-inquiry. And what it's simply, it's about learning to look at yourself and, and really getting real with yourself and peeling away all those layers of the personality that limit us and that block us from that knowing who we truly are. And so, um, you know, it's, it's mostly about examining uh, childhood conditioning, um, all the things that we're taught in school about who we are and, you know, what life is about and all those things that the world teaches us that uh, prevent us from knowing this truth of who we are. So, so um, we unravel all those patterns and the habits and the ways of thinking and, and the ways we behave um, that keep us stuck. They, they, and they and really the the place where we're stuck the most is in the negative emotions, you know, the anger, the pain, the fear, all the different things we experience in life, which are so uncomfortable and which uh, you know it's essentially suffering. So when you peel all that stuff away, it's incredibly freeing. And and when you do this work of self inquiry that we're talking about, um, you become liberated you you become uh free of that that false sense of identity and you start to discover who you truly are which as i said is love and and so i guess to answer if i can answer your question in the shortest possible way how do we live as an enlightened being well it's really simple you make a commitment to love and and you practice love and um you begin to identify more and more with the awareness that that's who you are. It's the love that you are. And everybody can practice this. It's very simple. So, you know, no matter where you're at on this continuum of of spiritual awakening or enlightenment or whatever you like to call it, uh, you can call it whatever you want. But, um, like, for example, everyone can practice simple acts of kindness and and kindness is love in its most simple form. So so really, uh, to answer your question, I would say a lot of it is about putting your love into action in the world. And just imagine, right? If if more and more people started doing this in the world, imagine a world where everybody's practicing kindness. You know, isn't that what we need right now? And in, in a world that's lacking so much in love. Right. So anyway, I hope that helps uh, yeah. answer. Yeah. Well, there's a lot to unpack uh, in that answer. And we'll also go into it in the later questions. Um, I think a lot of people 
are probably having um, a difficult time moving into the space of ego dissolution and maybe um, don't have the right toolkit or an understanding of, of how to navigate. And I think it also to go through the process of ego dissolution or a true ego dissolution um, takes a lot of courage um, because it's not for the faint of heart, right? There are uh, what you call the dark nights of the soul. Um, so I think that, you know, from my perspective, there's a lot of um, questions and uncertainty and lack of uh, guidance. So, which is why I, I'm so excited about organizations like Corelight, um, because you have the toolkit that can walk people through this this space, and especially in the book uh, Marriage of Spirit. And so, I'd love for you to also share a little bit about what Corelight is. It's a, it's a nonprofit um, organization, and also um, what the Spiritual Warrior Training Course is. Yes, yeah, happy to share. And let me just address what you just said because I think you brought up a really important point. Most people are are very afraid of the word shadow or of looking at the unconscious or whatever it's known as ego dissolution. You know, it sounds scary. And, and the truth is it is, it doesn't have to be, it, it, it is actually, um, like you said, it is a path for the courageous because we do have to overcome the fear, but fear is the key. Fear is one of the main things, uh, in life that stops us from living a full life, from living a happy life. And so, so much of it, I think, is about uh, transmuting the fear. It's really like, have you ever had those experiences where you're so afraid of something and you avoid it and you avoid it and you avoid it and finally somehow you're confronted with it, whatever it is, you know, maybe it's public speaking or uh, there's maybe a, a bully or an enemy or somebody and, you know, suddenly it's like there and you've got to face it. And when you're done, usually it's nothing. And we, we spent so much time worrying and fussing and avoiding and putting tons of energy into, you know, trying to stop it or whatever. And then when we do it, uh, very often it, it's uh, hugely freeing and life changes enormously. So, so yes, it can sound scary, but uh, my experience of it has been for the last 30 years that I've been doing it is that um, it actually isn't. It actually uh, – it, it turns out if you if you face uh, what some people call your demons, you know, if you face your your yourself in the mirror, um, which is one of the most challenging things to do in the world, it's the thing that liberates you. You know, it's the thing that that really frees you up and helps you have a more fulfilling life. So anyway, good good point. I'm glad you brought that up. And um, and yes, you asked me about core light and. Uh, yeah, Corelight is the nonprofit that Leslie and I started about 25 years ago to support our spiritual teaching work. And you asked about spiritual warrior training, and that's one of the foundational courses that we offer. Uh, and our book that you were talking about, it's called The Marriage of Spirit, Enlightened Living in Today's World. And that's part of that course. And it also includes uh, a series of audios that Leslie recorded. And, and I'm, I'm actually going to be reteaching that course live sometime, uh, probably in the next few months. So if that's of interest to anybody, uh, there's more information about it at our website on the courses page. Oh, and I would also say there are free chapters of the book online. If you want to go to our website and look under the free resources tab, there are free chapters of all of our books there. Amazing. Okay, great. Um, and uh, Brad, can we go back to this point about, um, you know, detachment and like the identity over identifying with this uh, narrative of who we are? I mean, why do so many people have trouble with detaching from this narrative? I think, you know, we're, so many of us hold on to it for dear life. You know, it's like, I have accomplished all these things, you know, I've gone to this school and I have this family, I have this partner, I have this house, you know, and I'm, I'm just curious, like how, what's, what sort of way, um, can people navigate, uh, through this detachment and why, why do you think so many people have trouble, um, with detachment? Well, I think one reason is probably that we're afraid if, if we live from a place of detachment, then life's going to be boring, mm. you know? 
I like, I remember, <laughs> I remember <laughs> we, we were teaching about this once and I remember there was somebody in the class who, he was a very funny guy and he said, uh, does this mean if I practice this, that I'm not going to be fun at parties anymore? <laughs> 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 so, you know, I think, um, it's to be clear, you know, that is definitely not what happened. Uh, detachment in the spiritual sense that we're using it here is a very high spiritual principle. And it's, it's essentially uh, what we touched on, we touched on a little bit, uh, which we would call witnessing. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the witness is that part of us that can observe neutrally, the part of us that uh, sees life from a higher perspective. It's that, you know, you know how you, you have that part of you that's always kind of, um, watching, mm -hmm. watching life. Well, the more we can identify that part with that part of us that's watching, uh, the more we can then be in this place of, of detaching and not being so attached to the polarities that are playing out in life. Um, so what happens really as you do this is that, that life becomes more fun. It becomes better when we get really good at that practice of witnessing uh, and, and, you know, seeing from a place of detachment, we actually learn to play the game of life a lot better. So, uh, in other words, we can surrender more, uh, we can see the bigger picture more. And, and usually what happens is as, as that part of us gets stronger, that witness uh, detached part gets stronger, we, we can, um, we usually experience more success in life, I would say. It's, um, this has been my experience, and many, uh, many, many people I know say the same thing. You, you experience more abundance. You uh, experience better relationships. You Generally, you feel more fulfilled in life when you develop this quality. Mm. Um, Beautiful. There's one, and there's one other thing. Uh, can I, there's one other thing I would say about detachment. I think another reason it gets a bad rap is because it sounds like you're withdrawing from, from life. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds like you're giving up or it sounds like, um, you know, uh, you're doing what a lot of people nowadays call spiritual bypassing. And I, I don't know if your, uh, listeners have heard of that term spiritual bypassing, but it really means that you're suppressing or, or avoiding or, um, denying your emotions. And that's definitely not what this is about. Detachment, the way we're using it, is not about not feeling emotions. And it's not about uh, not experiencing the juiciness of life. You know, I, I would say, uh, in fact, if, if you do this, you, you, you feel even more deeply. And uh, you're still very sensitive, and you're still very engaged with life. It's just that uh, you become better at um, at letting go of your attachment to the things, and and you can then uh, remember that you are not your emotions, and you're not the the things that you desire. So you really you stop identifying yourself as being those things, and and because that's really what creates suffering. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. That's powerful. Oh, thank you. And Brad, you and Leslie talk about working through polarity and moving towards this oneness. Um, you know, and I think that also can help define, uh, the detachment piece, like really moving through the good and bad, right and wrong, um, you know, anger and joy and just the, the polarities of life, really the zero sum game reality that we're all in. Can you tell us about this process? Um, you know, when I did this process, I'll just tell the audience, it dramatically changed my life. Um, it was an incredibly powerful tool. So I'm wondering if you could just walk us through this process and also share on, you know, how we can become more of the witness. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you, Yasmin. I'm, I'm not surprised to hear you say that because most people who practice this have that same experience. It's amazing the shifts in consciousness and the shifts in life that we can make through doing this kind of work. So I guess what, what I would say uh, is to, to give a little bit of background here. We live uh, in a system of duality on this planet. So for almost anything you can name, there's an opposite side. 
uh, and, and you see it in the physical world, you know, for example, you've got day and night and you've got summer and winter and you've got the drought and the flood and, and so on. And then it's also true for human consciousness. So, for example, like you said, there's uh, there are the polarities of things like happiness and sadness, pain and pleasure and, and so on. And and we we experience only one side of those polarities at a time. So we're always swinging. We're always swinging between the two sides of the polarity um, because it's this dualistic world. And, and generally, uh, we're asleep to this. And, and our consciousness is ruled by that flip-flopping of the polarities. So it's literally, um, it's literally like an enslavement. We, we're actually enslaved by that system of duality because we identify so much with either side of the polarity. So, um, so for example, uh, rich and poor, uh, like you said, good and bad and right and wrong. And, and so we're, we're always uh, desperate to try to, to try to be on the positive side. And we, we really fear being on the negative side of most of these polarities. And, and so um, we often get immersed in that experience that we, we start to identify with these things. And we believe that we are these things. Like, I, you know, I'm poor, or I'm angry, or, uh, or I'm guilty, or, you know, whatever. So, so we're, we're essentially enslaved to our conditioning. And uh, it's, it's like we're constantly running on a, on a treadmill towards the positive side, and we're running away from the negative side. But as I'll bet you everybody that's listening has experienced, it doesn't really work very well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because the negative side, what does it do? It usually catches up with you at some point and bites you in the butt. And then you get a shock. And in life, you know, that's when we suffer. So when, uh, when we begin this path of enlightenment, uh, we start to wake up to this habit. Because that's really all it is, is a habit. And, and you learn that you don't have to be a slave to those polarities and that there is a path to freedom and, and that it's all about working with polarities and reconciling them inside of us. Um, so it, it, to be clear, it's not that polarities don't exist anymore. They exist, but it means that you're not enslaved by them and uh, you can reconcile them inside you and you can transcend them. Um, so one, I, one of the aspects of becoming free of that enslavement is, is witnessing. And that was the other part of your question. So let me just say a little bit about that. Um, we, we spoke a little bit about it previously, but let me elaborate. Um, so as I said, the witness is, we could also call it the neutral observer. And it's that part of us that observes life from a place of, of neutrality and detachment, as we said. And, and so from that place, we can watch uh, the dance of the opposites playing out. And, and we don't identify as one side of the polarity or the other. Um, I like to, to give the image, I liken it to the fulcrum of a seesaw. Right, the the child's uh, and the child's in the playground, the the thing that the children sit on and go back and forth on the seesaw, the painful and pleasurable experiences of life and all the negative and positive moods fluctuate, but we remain as that observer in the middle, and we don't identify as one side or the other, and that's the whole key. So when we start to wake up. We don't identify ourselves as that experience. Um, so in other words, that part of us that we would call the witness, it recognizes that we're not the pain, we're not the sadness, uh, we're not the negativity. We remember that we are that infinite spark of the divine. We are the pure awareness. We are the pure love. And we're a perceiver, mainly, I would say that, that we are, we are a perceiver. And the emotions pass through us, but we remain as the perceiver. 
And, and so on the path, we learn to watch ourselves uh, doing those roles of the personality, uh, the habits that we talked about, the conditioning. And, and we get to know uh, our, our conditioning, our, our cultural conditioning, the habits, all those aspects of the ego that, that keep us trapped. And um, we're taught to perceive in most people, you know, well, everybody, I guess, we're taught as children um, that we are the personality, as I said. So, so you would think it's impossible to see ourselves. If, in other words, if we think we are the personality, who is it that's doing the seeing? Mm, right? Yeah. It, it, would be, it would be like an eye trying to look at itself. So, so to wake up, we have to choose to take this position of the witness and observe from outside the personality. Wow. So anyway, there's, there's a lot more we could say, and, and we did write a book about it. There's a lot more there, but um, it's that, the book that we talked about, The Marriage of Spirit. And we teach methods of witnessing and reconciling polarities, and, and that's also part of the Spiritual Warrior course. But um, I think it's just we could sum up by saying that you know, the witness is a really, really helpful tool on the path of spiritual awakening because it, it helps us to see who we truly are. Um, you know, it helps us to see beyond our identifying with the body and the ego and the small, what we call the small self. And, and the witness uh, is actually our connection to our higher self or to spirit. Mm, and, yeah. and as that witness self, as that witness gets stronger, we move more into unity consciousness. Yeah. And Brad, one of the um, exercises that I thought was incredibly powerful was, uh, I think it was in chapter nine uh, of Marriage of Spirit, where um, you talk about uh, describing an event that caused you, you know, an emotional spiral. <laughs> so let's talk about, um, you know, an event like getting caught in traffic or, um, you know, maybe like a family member getting you really angry or you just, you see yourself spiraling. Right. And, uh, the exercise, and I'm probably, you know, there's a lot more to this exercise, but I'll just give a high level overview is to describe that event in detail, feel all the feelings, circle all the emotions, put all the, you know, negative emotions on one side of the paper and then either get a thesaurus or, uh, get something, um, to understand what the opposite is and then go through this exercise of offering up these polarities and, and asking for guidance to balance them. That, that process, um, was, was really powerful for me as a step on the journey towards becoming more of the witness, because it's so funny that I didn't even know what the opposite of some of these emotions were. Like I had to really think about <laughs> it and look it up. And so if I can't even understand its opposite, you know, how far away am I from that, uh, feeling and emotion. And, and so I think, and you bring up so many good points. And I think the moment that we're in, the emotional world, you know, there's, there's something that's a program that's running, right? It's not the real us. It's, there's something that's triggering us. Um, so, so that's been also my work where the moment I'm in an emotion, I start to question like, okay, this is not, this is not me. Um, and, and so how can I be a perceiver of this situation? And the moment I remove myself from the emotion, it becomes so much easier to, to handle, <laughs> You know, even mm -hmm. starting this interview, yeah. I was telling Brad, I had a couple of tech issues and, uh, usually there's a moment where I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to call my team. But then I, I was like, wait, I'm, I'm interviewing Brad from Corelight and the exercise of just becoming the witness is really powerful now. <laughs> so I actually just removed myself from the emotions and then miraculously things just started to work. So <laughs> it's very, very interesting. <laughs> Good example. Yeah, funny how that works, right? Yeah. I think you, you really hit the central point uh, because when the, the, the core of, of most of the techniques we work with is about finding the opposite side. Uh, because when you're in a situation that's painful or difficult or whatever, um, the, the, there's, we talked about uh, 
the polarity, you know, that we're in this world of duality and you, you're always flip flopping between sides of polarity. So it's really helpful is when you're in one side, it's helpful to say, well, what's the opposite of this? Because then that helps you witness and you realize like, oh, wait a minute, this is the system of duality. I'm just flip flopping between polarities. That's all that's happening right now. I'm feeling hatred <laughs> for, <laughs> for the situation or for whatever. What's the opposite of hate? Oh, it's love. Of course it's love. And then you suddenly you're in the witness and you, you're that fulcrum place of a teeter-totter and you watch the dance of the negative and the positive. So it's, uh, that's one simple tech, very simple technique is just name the opposite side in any given moment. You first, you have to be able to at least name what you're feeling or name the, what you're in, what situation you're in. Um, and then you find the opposite side. So that's simple. You know, I also think that, uh, the moving past the masculine feminine polarities before going into all the other polarities, um, is something kind of central to your teachings. So I think that is also a really interesting concept. Um, so I don't know if you want to speak to that because I do think that there's a lot of, um, you know, confusion around the masculine and feminine and, and what that means, you know, in, in the world yeah. of patriarchy and absolutely. Well, I mean, it, it's just, it's a huge, huge topic that's very, very charged, uh, the topic of masculine and feminine. And I can tell you in 30 years of doing, uh, spiritual events, um, the two topics that bring up the biggest charge for people, uh, the first one is money. And the second one is masculine feminine. Because those two things uh, go right to the core, you know, they, they really touch raw nerves inside of us. Those, those things, um, they, they have tentacles into every area of our lives, both of those things. And, and so, I mean, I've, I've done, uh, you know, six week seminars on the, this question about uh, reconciling the polarity of masculine and feminine. So there's just, there's just so much to be said, but, um, let me just see if I could, uh, I guess, briefly to just answer your question, since it's a, a short interview, uh, what I would say is that, uh, it's one of the most important things we can do in life right now. It's one of the, uh, one of the highest callings, uh, because, um, uh, for thousands of years, we've been in this system of patriarchy, and uh, the masculine energy has dominated the feminine energy. Um, and it's time now. You know, we're moving into a new paradigm. We're at this pivot point in human evolution right now. It's this extraordinary time that we've all incarnated into. And as souls, you know, we chose the time for this purpose. Like we're supposed to birth a new paradigm that's more balanced. And it's not about the feminine dominating the masculine, it's about coming into balance. It's about um, holding both the masculine and the feminine. The, the yang, as they say in Taoism, it's the yang and the yin. And, um, you know, we are, we are neither the masculine or the feminine. For seven and a half billion people on the planet, or whatever the population is, there are seven and a half billion different permutations, different combinations of yin and yang, masculine and feminine within each of us. So we each hold some of both. Um, and we each have, uh, let's just say there's somebody who's way over polarized on the masculine side. You know, they're very much entrenched in a patriarchal program. Well, they've got a, a, a very powerful unconscious side that is projected out of them, which is their feminine side. It's the side that they're, uh, they're not embracing, they're not looking at, they maybe don't want to know. And, and so that feminine side or the yin side is mirrored back to them by all the women in their lives, in their life their mother, their wife, their sister, da sisters, daughters, whatever. Um, so this is, uh, you know, this is how we can, it's one of the methods we teach. And I'm, I'm just 
touching on the surface, but it's one of the ways we look at these mirrors in our life of the people in our life and what they're mirroring back to us because it tells us a lot about our own unconscious side. If I'm, if that person I described is projecting out and stuffing into their unconscious, their feminine side, they're going to get that mirror back. And so what they can do then is to, to look at, uh, name what they see in the feminine side and recognize, oh, this is my polarity. Mm. And if I can just, if I can just name that and integrate it, uh, and we have the methods of doing that in the book, but if, you know, if, if, if I can, if I can do that, then I become more balanced inside myself. I don't have to be locked into a pattern that's purely masculine. I can actually, uh, have both. I can have both the masculine and the feminine inside me. And it doesn't mean I'm, I'm going to become less masculine. Um, it just means that I, I embrace the feminine. Mm. And so I, I feel like that's what a lot of us are here to do is we're here to embrace our opposite side and to learn what that means. And, and, um, it, it actually means, uh, relationships that are, um, more collaborative, more, uh, equal, not, uh, competitive, not antagonistic. Mm, wow. That um, is... We become more balanced. <laughs> Brad, that is such a powerful point. Oh my gosh. I want to have a entire conversation just about that. Oh. Well, we could really, cause there's so much more to say and I'm passionate about it. I'm absolutely, I teach about this a lot. I taught a course about it and it, I'm, I'm absolutely passionate because it's why we're here. You know, yeah. this is one of the big reasons why we're here. We're shifting out of patriarchy and, and to do that, we've got to be able to embrace our opposite side. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's been, uh, I think, uh, the work that all of us are, are working on, um, and maybe some, you know, are starting, but uh, that was something that I investigated about four years ago and it was, it, you know, dr drastically shifted my life and the people that came into my mm. life and how I operated with others. And I think for me being a, in a, in that state of balance is, is a, it's a challenge, I think, especially since so much of uh, biz, the business world has been rewarding um, this the cap the kind of capitalistic and maybe patriarchal um, viewpoint. And so I think, I mean, I think that that's changing, and I've definitely see that seen that shift uh, in the last, uh, especially the last couple of years, where you know I think that there's there's going to be a new movement even of what it means to be abundant and it, it, and how it plays out in the real world. So that's just really interesting, though. I, I want to take that course. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree with everything you said. And there, there, could I say one more thing about it? Oh, I think yeah. there's one more interesting little story I could tell. Of course, yeah. It may mean we don't get to the rest of the questions, but this is what's up. So <laughs> let me share this little story with you. Okay. It was about uh, 20, 20 years ago. Uh, well, first of all, my, my, my wife, my life partner, Leslie, is Claire Audient. Uh, which means she hears her spiritual guides telepathically. Um, and that's how she's been taught uh, what she learned. And um, so 20 years ago, if you remember, it was a really challenging time uh, in the world, but especially in the United States. Um, the 9-11 uh, the had happened and the Iraq war was starting. And, you know, uh, life was just hard. It all seemed very unfair and uh leslie in a very rare instance this i i've known her for 30 years now and i don't ever remember this ever happening except this one time and she was so upset about what's happening in the world and she actually told me she said i screamed at my spiritual guides <laughs> 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 and she said this is not okay what is it going to take to change the world and she said her guides responded very quickly and very uh, succinctly. And they said, a lot of enlightened women. Mm, wow. And uh, when she told me that, I thought, wow, it really made me ponder. And I thought, huh, well, what about me? <laughs> what, am I, what am I, chopped liver? You know, what, what about the men? And, um, and we talked about it a lot and we processed it. And what, I, what we came up with was, well, what the guides 
are saying is that it's not that it's not important for men to wake up as well and for men to balance themselves as well. But what's most important is for the women because, and the reason for that is because, and I, I, I'm aware that this is going to probably anger some people. It might, I'm, and I'm sorry about that. I don't intend to just hear me out. Just give me a few minutes before you hang up. So there, they were, <laughs> they were saying that it's, it's really important for women because for several thousand years of the age of patriarchy, uh, the, the women's power, the power of the feminine, let's say, because it's, in, it's within men and women, but the power of the feminine has been suppressed. And so as women begin to wake up and take their power and, and become enlightened in their spiritual power, they rise up to meet the masculine power um, and, and so it's as though it's a, it's been an interesting phenomenon over the course of, uh, you know, 25 or more years that we've been doing spiritual events and with, with most, uh, spiritual teachers, we know most spiritual events, uh, it's a huge percentage of women and usually a very small percentage of men. And we've pondered like, why, why is that? Why are women more drawn to this particular work of self-inquiry than, than men? Um, and I, my, my theory is that, well, you know, the truth is that a lot of men don't have an incentive to change. A, a, a lot of men are still holding power in the world and they're happy with that. And so they don't see any reason for them to change. Um, a lot of men who come to events, uh, spiritual events are dragged by their, their wives or their spouses. Um, and, um, you know, they don't really want to be there, but women for the most part, because they've been uh, suppressed for, for so long, they have incentive to change. And so the more that women uh, are empowered in, in the world and the more they wake up and, and become enlightened, um, it's as though there's a balancing that happens mm -hmm. between the masculine and the feminine. Not necessarily between men and women, although that happens. It's more I'm talking about energy. I'm talking about masculine and feminine energy in the world. So I, I, sorry, I don't mean to offend the men and I, I certainly don't mean to offend women. Um, if you've taken it that way, please understand what I'm saying is, um, that it's really about the energy and we have both the masculine and feminine energy inside each of us, no matter our gender. Um, uh, so I just, I found that so interesting, you know, that, um, and, and then what was interesting was many years later, it was in like the last five years, uh, the Dalai Lama came out and, and he was also asked, what's it going to take to change the world? And he said, it'll, it'll be Western women, uh, awakened, uh, awakened women, especially in the West, I think is what he said wow. that, and that's what will change the world. And I've heard it from other sources as well. So uh, wow. it's, it's just, it, it's, um, it's something to ponder, I think. Wow. Wow. I just got chills when you <laughs> said that story and share that story. So, um, thank you for sharing that. Wow. Um, it's very rare. I get speechless on these conversations, but <laughs> it's happened a couple times. <laughs> um, Brad, can you tell us about the eight keys? I know you have the eight keys book and the eight keys are also, mentioned, uh, actually, I think it was the seven keys at the time we were mentioned in the marriage of spirit. Um, can you tell us about the eight keys? I just thought, you know, something I had never read before and I just thought it to be very profound. And I think also maybe explaining what the Shishumna is, um, to people so that they understand what the eight keys mean. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we, Leslie and I wrote a book a long time ago called returning to oneness, the seven keys of ascension. And we just republished it a couple of months ago in a new edition, and, and we added a chapter on this new eighth key. Um, and so the book is about how there is a flow of life force that runs through the body, and that's also called kundalini, and it's like a river. And when it flows fully all the way through the body, we, we feel happy, we feel fulfilled, and that's uh, – we're, we're very awake spiritually, but unfortunately a lot of the time it just doesn't flow very well. 
and and so uh, the book is about the limitations in in consciousness and the limitations in the body that restrict the flow so it's both the body and the mind that restrict the flow and it offers this very simple set of eight keys it's a very thin little book but it packs a punch it's very powerful it's a simple set of eight keys that unlock the knots in consciousness that prevent the flow and the the shashamna as you call it it's that's the sanskrit word it's an ancient word but it's essentially it just means the core it's the core of our of our being if you are clairvoyant uh, and you can see clairvoyantly you can see the the aura and the subtle body if you could see the shashumna, you would see it as a, a tube of light that runs down the center of the body right in front of the spine from the top of the head all the way down to the root chakra, which is at the base of the spine. And it actually st- extends beyond the body as well, above the head and down below the root into the earth. But it's, it's essentially our core. And um, that is where the flow of Kundalini uh, is. It, the river that we're talking about flows up and down that core of our being. It's the core of enlightenment that's within each of us. Wow. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, very helpful. Um, and I'm wondering if we could talk about just one of the keys. Um, one that's been on my mind mm-hmm. a lot is, and I believe it's maybe the six to seven chakra, there is no gain or loss. Um, because I yeah. think that's a, that's a really powerful and important, uh, key. And so I'm wondering if you could maybe elaborate on that. Yeah, that is the key that opens the third eye, the sixth chakra. Um, and, um, boy, again, there's a lot that could be said. Let me see <laughs> if I can be succinct about that. Uh, it's a great question. Um, in at one level of reality, there is no such thing as loss and gain. And I know when you hear that, you know, you think, what? <laughs> That's just crazy because I, you know, I just lost uh, all this money or, you know, my, my partner just left me. I've, I've, I've lost them. So how can you say there's no such thing as loss and gain? Well, you know, yes, at the at that level, the physical third dimensional level, there is loss and gain. And that's the flow of polarity. That's the dance of duality that we're talking about. But at another level of consciousness, another level of seeing, you see that that's actually not the reality. The if you if you look if you look at the uh, schematic of the subtle body, which is what we do in this book, Returning to Oneness, um, you see how at the different chakra levels, uh, there are different levels of perception, let's say. And so um, that third eye, which is the place for people who aren't familiar with the chakras, the third eye or the sixth chakra is the place between the eyebrows and slightly above in the forehead there. And um, when the light, the uh, spiritual energy flows into the body from above and comes down into the crown, uh, into the head, it's the light of unity. It's, it's where the, the polarities are all unified in, in that pure spiritual state. But when it comes down into the body, it starts to filter into the system of duality, and it's at the third eye where it literally becomes the duality. Uh, the one eye, third eye, becomes the two eyes, the duality. So when we can see from the third eye, we see the unity, we see beyond the polarity, we see that at that level, there's actually no such thing as loss and gain. And uh, that is freedom. Because it's at that point that you, you realize that we don't have to be enslaved by the polarities. We can see beyond that to the truth that we are not these bodies. We are not uh, the thing that, was, that left us. Um, we can uh, live a life where 
We are not attached to those things of the world. Things come and go all the time. They always will. If we're so attached to something that we are devastated when we lose it, then we're destined for a life of suffering. Um, so we're not saying it's not important to grieve. Uh, of course, when, when we suffer a loss, uh, you know, the death of a loved one or somebody leaves or whatever, of course, we're going to grieve and we're going to feel that loss. And we're going to feel pain in our body and our emotions. And that's perfectly natural and something we need to do. We need to give the heart its due and allow it. But at the same time, when we're seeing from that other level, we can also say, well, what is the gift and the opportunity here in this situation? Uh, there's always a gift and an opportunity. And it takes a little time sometimes to actually see what, what that gift and opportunity is. We, we tend to, you know, we need to have the time of grieving the loss uh, before we can kick into what you might call the learner self or the witness self that is ready to learn whatever the lesson is that our soul came to learn here through, through the loss of that thing. Yeah. Wow. Does that help? Yeah. Super helpful. Um, Brad, I want to talk about the triangles, uh, process from the book. And I know we don't have time to talk about the squares process, but maybe you could just, uh, briefly share what that is at a very high level. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the squares technique would take a little while to teach, so we don't have time for that. But I would say of all the techniques that we offer, the squares is the most powerful of all. And um, it's an incredibly helpful uh, but simple journaling technique that, that you can use to create a massive shift in your consciousness and in your physical world. And um, uh, my, my spouse, Leslie, her, her guides gave her her spiritual guides, inner spiritual guides, gave her that technique many, many years ago. And she used it to overcome chronic fatigue syndrome about 30 years ago. And that never returned for her because of the squares technique. And we've heard other many other stories like that from people. Uh, I can't even tell you how many people reported big successes in their life with using that technique. And, and you can use it for health or finances or relationships or whatever or just for your own spiritual awakening. You can apply it to anything uh, in life where you feel stuck. And so it's about shifting consciousness. And, and then that, by shifting the consciousness, we shift the outer world. Uh, so, um, so yeah, so if people want to know about that technique, they'll have to get the, the book. Um, but we could do the triangles. Those are pretty quick to teach, so I could share about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, triangles, um, very simply put, is um, as we talked about before, you know, you're, we're working with polarity. So you would name a polarity. Um, and I'll, the, the quickest way to teach triangles is just to do one. So I'll just walk through one. Okay. And so let's just say we're in a situation where um, maybe we did something bad to somebody and we feel guilty. So you would just, you'd be feeling this terrible guilt and you'd be wondering, oh gosh, how do I resolve this? You know, I feel terrible. So first of all is you name what it is. So you would say, oh, I'm feeling guilt. And then you would say, well, what's the opposite of guilt? So I'm going to go ahead and, and make you the guinea pig, Yasmin. What's the opposite of guilt? Um... <laughs> What's the opposite of guilt? <laughs> Putting you on the spot. <laughs> um, I would say like confidence. Uh, I don't actually know what the opposite of guilt. Maybe it's just love. The, tr the truth is there, there are no rules to this. It's like a game we're playing here. There are no rules. So there's no right and wrong answer. But what I would say for the opposite of guilt is innocence. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so so that's, one, I mean, that's one answer, but everybody might come up with a different answer. So, so let's say we have guilt and innocence that we're dealing with. And the triangle technique is very simple. Um, you visualize the polarity of guilt and innocence as a uh, as a polarity. You can you can envision it like right in front of you. And polarities usually play out in the lower chakras, the third, second, and first chakras, uh, solar plexus, navel, and root chakras. And so you can envision that polarity uh, as a 
horizontal line uh, in your subtle body down in the lower chakras. And what you say then is what is the ascended balance of this polarity? And the ascended balance is would it would be the tip of if the triangle. In other words, it would be uh, a heart, a state that lives more in the heart center or the higher chakra centers. So, uh, so you would invi- you visualize a triangle superimposed over your body. You, the the bottom, uh, the baseline of it is in the lower chakras. It's the guilt and the innocence, guilt on one side, innocence on the other. And then you envision the top of the triangle in the heart and you say, all right, what's the, what would be a word that would help reconcile this polarity and bring me into my heart? So with guilt and innocence, can you think of a word that might do that, that might reconcile that polarity and help you bring it more into your heart? Um, like acceptance? That's a good one. Acceptance is one. And um, another one could be forgiveness. Mm. Because forgiveness, acceptance and forgiveness are both heart qualities. So it's there's no rules. Again, it can be whatever word helps you get into your heart and reconcile that polarity. But it's like you can look at it as a game. It's a word game. And when you find the right word, you feel the shift in your body and in your consciousness. So let's do let's do another couple of examples, which will just illustrate the point for people, because it is very powerful and very simple if you can get this. So let's say we're feeling shame. Uh, what might an opposite of shame be? Mm, I would. And this might be hard. I might go ahead. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was just going to say, like, innocence also uh, comes up for shame. Um, mm-hmm. OK. Yeah. So another one would be uh, pride, or uh, to take it even more extreme, is arrogance. Mm. Shame and arrogance are a, a, a powerful polarity. So, so let's just say we're working with that polarity as the, the dance of polarity that we're doing. You know, very often when we feel uh, ashamed of something, um, to counteract that, we might need to find the thing that brings us pride, right? So that's the the dance of the duality. Um, mm. So what what would be, um, and, and pride taken a step further into a really uh, deeper level of ego would be arrogance. Mm. So that's the polarity, shame, shame and arrogance maybe, or shame and pride. So what would the ascended balance word be? Can you think of a word that would bring it up into the heart and reconcile it? Hmm, like I would say something like confidence, uh, grace, self-love, one of those. Those are all good. Those are all really good words. And another one would be humility. Hmm. Um, because humility is that quality where we see that we, we're, we have neither, we don't identify with either the shame or the arrogance. But we find this place inside us that has humility. And that is, can you feel in your body? Can you, it's a, it's a, mm. an attunement to your consciousness and to your body. So you can feel in your body when you hear that word. Does it help bring you up into the heart? Does it help bring you out of that, that um, flip-flopping of the polarity? Mm, yes, yeah. So this is, this is yeah. So this is what we do with words. And I could, I could give other, let me give you two quick examples. I won't belabor the point, but another one would be um, worthlessness versus entitlement. That's another polarity. And uh, 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 an ascended balance word that might reconcile it and bring it into the heart is gratitude. Mm. Okay. Uh, another example would be ignorance versus knowledge. You know, we might be feeling particularly stupid about something or <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> feeling ignorant. And having knowledge would make us feel uh, better about ourselves. And that's the polarity we're working with. And so the ascended balance word might be wisdom. Mm. Well, that's cool. We see beyond polarity. You know, so anyway, in, in the book, there's a whole list. Uh, we, we offer a list of, of heart, what we call heart states. And it's a great list to have because... 
whenever you're feeling down, whenever you're feeling stuck in a polarity, it's easy sometimes just to look at the list of heart states and say, oh, yeah, okay, that's I, I want to be in, in love. I want to be in gratitude. I want to be uh, in inner peace or humility or whatever it is, or forgiveness, you know, all these uh, generosity, these wonderful words that bring us into the heart. Mm, that is so cool and beautiful. Wow. <laughs> um, I'm going to do a triangle exercise later today that uh, you sparked my, my interest in, in oh, good. some, some new polarity that's come up as, as it usually does <laughs> in the game of life. Well, a lot of people find, a lot of people find that they, they make this a way of life that they just like to live this way. They're always asking what's the opposite. And they're always asking what's the ascended balance. Mm -hmm. And it's just a way of quickly and easily getting into your heart. Oh, wow. So powerful. And it's very, it's like easy. I mean, I think wordsmithing yeah. might be, <laughs> might be difficult at first, yeah. but I think once you get into the knowledge of these lower states and then it's opposite, I think it becomes, you know, uh, it'll probably become easier over time. Right. Cause we probably all gravitate towards yes. the same, what is it? you know, the same triggers, like the same eight or eight to 10 triggers for, and each of us have different yeah. ones, but yeah, I think knowing what those are is incredibly powerful when, when it happens. Yes. Yeah. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. Yes. Yeah, mean, Brad, where did you and Leslie learn your philosophy from? Um, I did read the book, so I actually know part of the answer to this. Um, but I'd love to hear in your words, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your journey? Sure, sure. Um, actually, it's interesting. I just wrote a book about my journey. That's the book you mentioned. And it's called Living with Enlightenment, Journey of Love. And a lot of it is about my relationship with Leslie because really I learned so much from her, from my, my spouse. Um, and Leslie, as I said, is a Claire audience. She hears her spiritual guides telepathically. And so a lot of what she's taught over the years comes directly from those guides. And, um, my, my path started with meditation. And when I first met Leslie about 30 years ago, she was my spiritual teacher. Um, but then after a couple of years, we realized that we were destined for a relationship. So we started a relationship and we didn't realize it at the time. But lo and behold, it's been a life partnership. And here we are 30 <laughs> years later, you know, and that's a, that's a story in itself. And I do tell that story in the book. Um, it's I know it's, and it's unusual because it's unusual to have your wife be your spiritual teacher. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> but. But we, we made it work. We made it work. And I, I wouldn't trade a minute of it. It was just the most blessed uh, experience of my life has been and still is. So um, so anyway, the work you asked about our work and what I would say is the work that we offer is very eclectic. You know, it's a blend of many different traditions and, and aspects of, of uh, you know, the spiritual path. But it mainly comes from three different traditions. Um, one, one of them is Yana yoga. Um, there are four main yogas, um, and Yana is the yoga of the mind. Um, it's an ancient spiritual path, which is, uh, based in what's known as non-duality, or you could call it unity consciousness. So that's one Yana yoga. And the second, um, tradition is Tantra. And um, Tantra is another ancient path uh, uh, of spiritual awakening. And, and it's about, most people don't know this, but Tantra really is about the reconciliation of opposites. And most people associate Tantra with sexuality. We hear about Tantra and we think of sexuality, and that's really the most well-known Tantric path. But that's not what we're teaching. Um, there's nothing you know, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that or anything. Uh, it's a it's a wonderful path for many people, but that's not what we're teaching. We're focused on the reconciliation of opposites in the mind and the emotions. So uh, tantra, and the third one um, is what you could call spiritual psychology, and that's really uh, it's taking the ancient spiritual teachings and reworking them re retooling them, revamping them so that they're more accessible and more understandable for, for the modern world. And we're just coming to our last uh, two questions. So 
Brad, what do you want to tell right. our listeners about their wellness? You know, what's sort of like your main takeaway? If you could kind of give people, you know, the last final statement about Coralite, about your philosophy, about what they could do today to start, um, you know, their path of enlightenment, what would you tell them? Okay. I would say um, to know that your physical world is an outpicturing of your consciousness. It's, it's just a mirror of your, your inner reality. So if you want to manifest good physical health, um, it's not only important to, to do the things we know, like eating right and exercise and all of that, but, but maybe the primary focus is on your inner well-being. And the same is true if you want to manifest uh, better relationships in your life or a better job or more abundance or whatever it is. The place to start is by looking in the mirror because you change your world by changing yourself. Mm. Powerful. Yeah, so powerful. Um, and Brad, are there any resources that you can point folks to in order to learn more about you, learn more about Coralite, uh, spiritual warrior training? And there's so much information. I've also downloaded uh, quite a few of your meditations. Um, so maybe you could tell listeners where they could find you, where they could learn more and, and get more involved, and also about the spiritual weather reports. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Yasmin. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of free resources on our website. And again, that's corelight.org, core, C-O-R-E, light, L-I-G-H-T, dot org. And um, you just go there and look for the free resources tab. And there's a lot of stuff there. Um, one of the things that you're talking about is our free monthly call. It's called the Spiritual Weather Report. And the dates for those calls for the next like six months or so are posted on the events page on the website. Um, and if you, if you want the invitation to those calls, you just need to sign up on our mailing list. So you go to the website and go to contact and you'll see the mailing list sign up there. And, um, and I also, you know, I offer events and courses throughout the year. Uh, so if you're on the email list, you, you get the announcements about courses and other th things that are happening. Amazing. Amazing, Brad. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I learned a lot in this conversation. I feel like um, your work and the work of Leslie is just so powerful. And I really hope people go check it out, whether it's the website, the book. Um, if you want to just sign up for their email list, I think they, you guys do a really good job of communicating what's happening on your event page. Um, I myself, am going to go check out, uh, the masculine feminine, <laughs> um, integration work. <laughs> it's that... not up yet. I'm sorry. The, the, <laughs> the, the masculine <laughs> feminine event that I, I taught a course a few years ago and we're in the process of editing it and putting it into a course that's available and it's not there yet. So I apologize about that, but oh, it's coming. No It'll worries. Be, I'm hopefully going, this year. I'm going to be <laughs> eagerly waiting in line for that to come out. So <laughs> <laughs> well, what I, one of, if you're interested in that topic, I'll tell you one of the places you can get it right now is in my book. The, the Living with Enlightenment book has quite a bit about uh, balancing masculine and feminine in it. And I tell, I think I even tell the story that I told on the call today. I think I tell that story in the book. Yes, I do. Amazing. So if you're interested in that topic, you could, you could read that book. Okay. I definitely will check it out. Um, I'll, that's going to be my next purchase. So Brad, right. thank you so much for your time. Really, really appreciate it. And for our audience, thanks for joining and for listening. In this episode, we learned about how to live in awareness and the path of the spiritual warrior with core light and so much more. You can tune into Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one -on -one conversations with leading experts in wellness and spirituality. Thanks again. <laughs>